Welcome back to another Senior Learning Institute's Educational Moment, where older adults and their loved ones turn for honest and straightforward information. In just a few minutes, you'll enjoy bite-sized, easily digestible nuggets of knowledge, empowering you to make the right decision the first time. So without further ado, here's our founder, certified senior advisor, seniors real estate specialist, nationally syndicated podcaster and speaker, the advocate you can trust, Mr. Ted Gottlieb. In theory, selling a home is straightforward. Find a buyer, write a contract, toss the keys on the table, and count your money. If it was only that straightforward, the Senior Learning Institute has assembled a group of well-respected experts dedicated to making your home selling experience both pleasant and productive. At this time, our panelists are going to introduce themselves. Let's start with John. Hi, my name is John Williams, and I'm with Moore Realtors, and I've been selling real estate since 1983 in St. Louis. Uh, I've been with a couple of different companies. Um, I'm currently a broker right now, working with a number of great people, uh, and very uh, excited about what the real estate market is doing in St. Louis. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Andrea Lenson, and I'm owner of Design to Sell, and what we do is we focus on occupied home consultation. So we have um, staging stylists that can go in and give you some good advice on what you need to do to get your house ready to put on the market. I've been in real estate, sorry, John, since 1979. So I have a <laughs> strong background in uh, real estate and I understand the market. And that's why I feel our services really can help you out in any kind of situation. So good to be here. Hi, this is Bruce Albach with Pyramid Home Inspection. Uh, it's great to be here. We have been providing home inspections since 2013. Thank you. And Shelly? Hi, I'm Shelly Schiller with Investors Title Company. I've been with Investors Title since 1991. Um, so I just celebrated 29 years, um, and I'm happy to be here this morning. Wow, thank you. And I'm Ted Gottlieb. I am the founder of the Senior Learning Institute and also a real estate agent since only 2003. So I guess I'm the rookie. Here today. <laughs> we've, got a lot, we've got a lot of experience here, which is, which is awesome. Uh, tell us, John Williams, what are some of the most important things a real estate agent can do to improve the odds of quickly selling a home without leaving money on the table? I think one of the things, first of all, Ted, I want to congratulate you on a great group of people here. And so, but from a real estate standpoint, I think an agent, what their job really is, is to understand and look at a property and be able to kind of guide somebody through what they're going to need to do. An agent is the type of person that's going to be able to determine what the market is for that property because the market is always changing. And so when an agent looks at a property and obviously they're probably going to, if they're needing to have some, some home preparation, they're going to utilize the services of say, say Andrea, for example, just to make sure everything is looking really good for the showing. But an agent is that person who can look forward to the market and anticipate what's gonna happen in the market and help somebody position their property in the market to be able to get the highest price in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of hassle. Right, I agree. So, you know, pricing it right is important, marketing, marketing it well, and, and prepping the home. And that's, you know, it seems really, really basic, but it's amazing how sometimes that's overlooked. And a lot of times there's situations where the home has not been maintained over the years. I'll give you a perfect example. Right next door to me, the house just recently went under contract. But when I looked at it, I knew it needed a chimney. I knew it needed a roof. And lo and behold, the house sold, but it sold for probably less than it could have. And yesterday they put the new roof on and the uh, chimney was rebuilt the other day. Had that been maintained years ago, they might've sold the house for more, but obviously it is what it is. Let, let's focus on preparing the home because that is so important. You mentioned that. What do you mean by preparing the home? Well, preparing the home, and, and I want to go back to something you said real quick before, because you talked about the property next door to you had some things that needed to be taken care of. You know, one of the things is, when you're trying to figure out pricing and trying to figure out market value, you can look at numbers on a piece of paper, but unless you physically look at a property, you don't always know what it's going to value is going to bring. And that's where experience comes in to say, hey, you know what, that property needs this type of work. And so that's where you get into the preparation. So maybe the carpet is old. 
maybe there needs to be a change as far as, and maybe there's a lot of wallpaper in a property that's not necessarily up to date for what today's market is. Or maybe some of the systems that need to be taken care of, or maybe there's some type of uh, structural issues, but that's where you go in because you can sell a property in any condition, but if you want to get the best return on value, there's a balance between the type of work you get to, you take care of and the type of uh, return you get. So selling a property as is, sometimes you're not gonna get as much money for it as if you did a few repairs, like put in say a dollar and you might get back $5 in return, for example. So home preparation involves a lot. Right. So it's that, it's the, the cluttering and staging, which is Andrea will talk about. But what I have found, uh, especially with my older adult clients, is the mindset of, hey, I've been living here for all these years. It works for me. It should be fine for somebody else. And there's a little bit of um, hesitancy to make some of the improvements that that maybe could be made to enhance the value of the home and, and help the home get sold quicker. So there's that fine line between really getting the house prepared and also being cognizant of the fact that spending the money is not very appealing to a lot of different people. So a lot of my clients are, yeah, great. Let's get ahead of it. Let's do it. Other ones are, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to touch the wallpaper. I'm not going to change the lights. If it's good enough for me, it's good enough for them. And then sometimes that impacts how quickly the home sells, but you know, we've at least uh, set those expectations up so that folks are going to be prepared for that. And another thing too, Ted, and I think you know this, is that everybody's situation is different. And so if somebody's staying, if somebody's living in the house and they don't want to go through the hassles, they're not going to rehab the house. And that's where they get that balance of trying to figure out what to do. But if a property um, is, let's say that somebody's moved out of the property and now at the problem it's vacant and maybe the the kids are, for example, if it's some as soon as kids are taken care of it and they want to maximize return on value, it just depends on that situation as but what they want to do. Right. Well, and that's why sometimes it's so appealing to to want to just go with that cash buyer, that investor who's going to come and buy the house and take it off your hands and deal with everything. And I understand how that might be appealing, but there's also a cost to that and the cost can be 50 cents on the dollar so when i find folks that want to just be done with it and get rid of it then fine we could sell it as is even though that may may not maximize your return but unless at least have a handful of investors take a look at it and let me get them to bid against one another and get you at least a little bit more money than you would had you just turned to one so i understand the temptation for sure. That's exactly about manu by being able to maximize the return. That is critical. And that's where you're talking about exactly because for some people, you know what? I don't want to do anything. I just give me my money. I want to, I'm, I want to sell. I want to just go. I want the least hassle and the most money for it. And so that's basically, yeah, speculative. Somebody coming in, an investor coming in and paying that, that's, that might be the avenue exactly for somebody, for a lot of people. Absolutely. And especially when you have the mindset of I paid 18 or 20 or $30,000 for it, and now I can get 150 or $200,000 for it. I think I got my money out of the house. So exactly. So, so I get it. So when it comes to determining value, John, how do you go ahead and determine what the market value of the property is? Well, okay, that's a great question, because there's a lot of items out there, especially with the advent of the internet, people have access to look and get a kind of an idea about what they think the value of their property is and obviously um, they one of the things they have to be aware of is whether you're going on sites that offer like estimates of the property those may or may not be the right indication they may be too high and inflate your mind as to what your value of your property is or too low so what we do is we'll actually obviously use the current data that we have in the local MLS as where is some off-market data that we have and then come together figuring out square footage and then also looking at the condition of the property itself to place it where we feel like it's going to be available for that market okay right and then at the end really no matter what you or I price the property at, the market's going to determine what the value is and the contract price um, is Always. really, really important. So then, and then the property needs to appraise. So why don't you talk to us a little bit, normally needs to appraise. If someone's getting a loan, the property has to appraise for what's being paid for it. So why don't you maybe elaborate a little bit on, on how important uh, that is in regard to having the contract amount um, at least be at what the market value is based on the professional eye of a, of a real estate appraisal. 
Well, and that's a good point. Even if a property is not getting a loan on it, often in our market, people will put appraisal riders or they'll make it contingent upon an appraisal. And so they have, you have to be aware that there is going to be a third party person, an appraiser, appraiser hired by either the person or the, the financial institution who's going to be doing the loan is going to be who's going to come through and they're going to determine what the value of it is. And so the loan itself, and that's a very important factor, the loan itself could dictate how that appraisal is going to be done because there are loans out there where people can borrow 100% of the property, of, of, the, of the, the sale price. And those type of loans, you have to be aware of, may become very, um, uh, very tightly looked at. So an appraiser comes through and they make the determination of what the value is. An appraiser is a licensed uh, individual, licensed through the state of Missouri, uh, to do property evaluations. And so that's, and those are mostly work for inst uh, financial institutions. And uh, if a property doesn't appraise, then there may be an issue with your contract. Right. So they look at your, the condition of your property compared to other properties that have sold in the area, right. ranch homes, yeah. other ranch homes, so on and so forth, and then determine what that is. So if for some reason it doesn't appraise, then what happens, John? If the property doesn't appraise, and then oftentimes it's going to dictate to what the contract says. And if the property doesn't appraise, then either the seller is going to have to reduce the price to what the appraisal was, or the buyer is going to have to pay the difference between the appraisal price and what the sale price was. Most of the times, buyers are unwilling to do that. So generally, what will happen is if a property does not appraise, then it's usually going to mean that the seller is going to need to do a reduction in price gotcha. in a typical transaction. Okay. Uh, is there a best time of year to, to list a house, John? Um, I would say typically um, in the market, we have seen historically uh, in St. Louis that the springtime seems to have the most activity. But the fact of the matter is, Ted, and I think you know this, is that in the all other times like the, um, um, the wintertime, there's less competition. So if you have a property that's priced right and positioned in the market, it actually may get a higher return on value because there's less competition out there because if people are always looking to buy and sell. But in the spring, when everybody's considering making that move for school district or whatever, trying to get in before the summer, what happens is you have a glut of properties come on the market and then what you have is a lot more buyers. But you know what, it's, just, it's the balance between the buyers and sellers. I've seen that it said that the second week in May was the best time to put a property on the market, but I'm not, I don't think it's that way this year. <laughs> so, I think, so I think it's, I think it just depends on the market at the time. Yeah. Right. I agree. I mean, uh, probably as you have as well, and we, we've sold around Thanksgiving, I've sold on Christmas Eve day. People come in town, they have to buy and there's, and you know, obviously there, there is something to be said for being one of the, um, you know, having fewer ho homes on the market that are competing with your listing and, and selling in the winter can work. Sure. The trees aren't going to be in bloom and there may be ice on the sidewalk, but sometimes people just need to buy. So you sell when you have to sell, but I'm, I'm with you. If I have my, my druthers, I'm going to, I'm going to urge that we get out in early spring. I'm a March, April guy to try to get ahead of the market. Uh, one last question for you, John. How do real estate agents get paid? Well, real estate agents can get paid a couple of different ways, but generally they're paid through what's called a commission associated with either a buyer's agency or a listing contract. So if you were selling a property, then most likely you've agreed to pay a commission to your listing um, company, listing broker. And that commission is going to be split between the listing agent and if there is a buyer's agent or a, a, an agent representing that working with the buyer. So the commission is paid that way. Um, sometimes agents will have their, sometimes buyer's agents will pay the commit, um, be paid by their buyers, but that's not typical in the market here in St. Louis. Generally, the commission is split between a listing agent and a buyer's agent. Got it. And, you know, and sometimes, um, I'll see on contracts that the buyer is actually paying a small fee to their agent as well, a transaction mm -hmm. fee. Uh, that's not something that we do. Uh, I, I just don't understand it, but that happens as well. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, and commissions can vary. There are some, some people say the, the, the number is 6%. Some agents get 7%. Some, some do it for less. To me, it's not the commission amount that matters. 
It's how much you're going to end up netting. And there are some folks who would say, I'd rather not work with a real estate agent because they think they're going to end up selling it um, themselves and getting more money out of it. I have rarely found that to be the case. And just things come up that really can get in the mm. way that you know, an experienced agent like John can circumvent and get this thing closed. I think, John, you're worth every penny that you get. And I would mm. say that all of your clients feel the same. So when you well, I will say this, Ted, is like, I'm not a very handy person. So if I have a plumbing leak upstairs, actually I do have a plumbing problem I have to go deal with. That means I have to go to the hardware store and I have to go buy a bunch of stuff to make it work. And then also what's gonna happen is, I'm gonna find out I don't have all the tools. So then I'm gonna have to go buy the tools. And then what I'm gonna find out is once I get into it, I may make a mess and make more destruction. And eventually I end up calling the plumber anyhow. So I've just figured out a long time ago, it was probably maybe 10, 15 years ago, I just call the plumber and I just call the expert. And I feel like sometimes, um, and I've helped a lot of people in that situation who were trying it before to get a higher price than they ever thought they would be able to just because of expertise and knowing how to market and get the property out to the right buyers at the right time. So, yeah. Yeah. I saw a listing yesterday of somebody, uh, one of my Facebook contacts who's selling it themselves and just, I, I had to just stop mm -hmm. when I started seeing the pictures. I mean, you can already tell. Um, that it, he's not doing himself any favors by exposing it to the market looking the way that it looks. So yeah, there's something to be said uh, for subbing out and, and using the experts. So along those lines, thank you, John, by the way, you know, as John had mentioned, getting the house ready to sell is, is really important. And Andrea Lenson helps me do that with most of the homes that I sell. I mean, I'm able to see the items that an inspector will typically see. Yeah, I miss stuff. That's why we bring inspectors in. But I'm going to be able to jump on most of those items and point those out ahead of time. But Andrea comes in and takes care of the cosmetic things and things that make the home more appealing that will bring people into the home to, to sell. So Andrea, why don't you share with us uh, what the difference is between restyling and staging and why it's so important to consider doing that when it comes to selling the home? Well, I think nowadays it's even more critical that the house just be pristine and look great because they're doing a lot of virtual, you know, tours online and the house just really needs to look perfect. And so restyling basically is when somebody's going to be living in their home while it's on the market, we will go in there and give them advice on what they need to do to appeal to the widest range of buyers. A general staging is mostly when the property is vacant and the homeowner is not going to be living in there. They don't want to show it vacant because the buyers can't perceive what things are going to look like and they think the rooms look too small when they're really not. So that's when you call like, you know, Dazzle Home Staging and they come in, they own their own furniture and they will bring in furniture and they will stage it. So staging basically is vacant, restyling is basically occupied homes. Got it. You know, because you and I both know that the first time somebody walks into a home that's mm -hmm. being listed, it's the second time they've seen it. They've seen Absolutely. it online and they're wowed online. And if they're not wowed online, the odds are really, really good. They're not going to come in and see the property itself. Uh -uh. You, yeah. you, I'll go next, next, yeah. Right, yeah. so it's just so important. So when you take your restyling or staging and combine that with professional photos, uh, it's just, it makes a statement. And um, gosh, I mean, I pay for your services to come in. I pay for the photographer to come in. Like John had said, I'm not going to do my own plumbing. Um, it, it, it makes all the sense in the world to bring the professionals in. It just makes a world of difference. So how do you determine then, because you had mentioned it, but let's just say I've got a house that has some leftover furniture in it. Um, and therefore, why don't I just restyle it? So how do you determine whether I use the, the leftover furniture or whether I bring in new furniture? Well, that's when you call me. And then we'll look at it. And if some of the furniture is very outdated, then we're going to recommend that furniture be gone. And really, we have to look at the demographics of the neighborhood, who's going to be buying in that neighborhood. So say if it was a senior and they've got pretty much outdated furniture, but this area is appealing to younger couples coming in now, then we want to make sure that furniture is going to appeal to that particular type of buyer. So we can tweak some things by adding, you know, toss pillows and artwork and area rugs, 
but it's really in their best interest if it's outdated that we can just we can bring in individual pieces we just can't do a whole you know vacant house right. and we've done that before okay so i've been with you when you've walked through a home and you you mm -hmm. have a notepad and you make mm -hmm. notes what mm -hmm. are some of the common things that you're looking for that you see on an ongoing basis the little things that can be done cosmetically that make a big difference when it comes to getting the home sold quickly? Paint, 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 paint. <laughs> I mean, that is the cheapest. They will get 100% back out of that because as you were saying, when they're looking online and you've got a red dining room and a green living room and a blue bedroom, and you know, I'm sure the homeowner loves it and that's great, but when you're looking online, the people are going, the buyers are going next because they're spending money right now to get their house ready to put on the market. The last thing they want to do is spend money on their new home. So they want a neutral palette and they'll decide at some point in time what, to, what colors to paint their room. So I think the best money they can spend on anything <clears throat> is painting and removing drapes. Open up those houses, get rid of those heavy drapes. Absolutely. Right. And it's so painful for a lot of people who so have spent painful. a lot of money on the valances and on the- I know. I know paper to get their arms around that. I know, I know, I know. But it's again, we are decorating for the buyer, not the owner. So it just depends. And like you say, some people don't want to do it, and that's fine. And we've had situations where they, you know, decide, well, you know, we don't want to do it. We like it. It'll be okay. And six months later, they'll give us a call and say, what was that paint color you recommended? You know, so they kind of go through the pains of it, realizing it's not going to work. They just, it's something that really needs to be done. It has to be done. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes it's just mind boggling too, because uh, I've had situations where the house is getting ready to hit the market and we're going to do some painting and somebody comes in ahead of the listing and looks at the house and ends up buying it. And you find out that the reason that they bought it was because they love that red accent wall in the, in the study, which you were going to have done, meaning I was going to suggest that they had painted over. And the stair climber that was going down to the basement, which we were debating back and forth, whether that should stay or whether that shouldn't stay, was also a selling feature. So yep. you just yep. you just <laughs> never know. You I know. darned if you do, you're darned if you don't. But statistically, you've got to know what's going to help. And I know which one you're talking about. I know that villa. And, and you know, we, we were ready to go on it. And we were right. We really were right. But yeah. Somebody did come in. That's a rare rarity that something like that is, is going to happen. So, you know, you got to have the odds on your favor. So that let's, was let's everything that thing. shouldn't have happened in that sale uh, happened. I know. And it's still sold. Okay. Even, you know, even the owner was involved and he, the owner was <laughs> selling the idea of the stair climber and he demonstrated it I know. And, I know. and the people loved it. So hey, sometimes Ted, you never know. Yes. Even a clock is right twice. A broken clock is right twice a day. Oh, <laughs> we'll find it out every once in a while. So I'm just saying. It, it, was, it, just, it, it was mind boggling. So, um, it was mind boggling. So yeah. do, you, do you have statistics that back up the importance of, of staging and restyling? Oh, yeah. I mean, we have seen that, um, first of all, it goes for more money, but usually 6 to 7% more than the list price that we've seen that. We just did a condo down in the West End and we really decluttered it quite a bit. Really very unusual condo. It went for 50,000 over list price. There was a bidding war on it. And he said that would have never happened if you hadn't come in and told us to declutter this, move this furniture, get this piece out of there, yada, yada. So it's, it's time on market. It's going to turn over so much quicker. You're going to get a higher dollar, no matter what you put in as far as investment to protect your equity, you're still going to come out of it a higher dollar, without a doubt. So it makes all the difference in the world. And especially, there's more listings out there that are occupied that are vacant. And so it's really important for those homeowners who are going to be living in their home to have us come in and talk to them because they, they develop what's called house blindness. And like you say, everybody comes in and say, oh, your house is beautiful. It's great. We love it. Of course you do. You've lived in it that way. So you can't see things the way we can see it. And after we've rearranged or done something, they go, oh, I really like it that way. I never thought about doing it that way before. So it makes a difference in every aspect of what you're doing. We've had that in a house. We've experienced oh. that together. 
uh, numerous times. And I yes. always tell the story about when I moved into my house, I pulled up the carpet to expose the hardwood floors. We removed all the wallpaper and the mirrors that were on the wall, except for one room, our master bedroom. Yes, the wallpaper is still there. I know <laughs> it's hideous. I no longer see it. It's gone. Nope. I'm fine nope. to it. But I know that when I go to sell the house, it's got to come off. Yep. Yep. And I think especially time right now where people are at home, and so if you're thinking about, you know, getting your house ready to put on the market, guess what? This is the best time to do it because you have time to declutter, depersonalize, all those kind of things. So, you know, you can get a, a handle on it right now. Right. And just to talk about the staging and how important it is as well. Mm -hmm. I think the numbers that I saw from you at one point was uh, selling or staging sells 73% faster, which is great. Absolutely. But bottom line is people need to be wowed when they see the house online. That's going yep. to induce them to come see the house in person. Then they're going to be wowed when they come into the house. And that's going to make a huge, huge difference. And when it comes to staging and we talk about what it costs. So that vacant house, Andrea, that needs staging, you know, I have a number in my head that it's somewhere between $2,500 and $3,000 in that range for a 2,000 square foot home to stage the key areas on the main floor in the master bedroom. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. And we also own our own inventory of accessories. And so what we've been doing a lot is bringing in our accessories. So if they don't have the correct artwork or they have things that are outdated, then we can bring it to try to give the house a new fresh look. And then our packages start about $9.95, you know, on up, depending on what they do. We leave it in the home for three months and um, we get everything all set up for them. Right. And the way, yeah, the way that I position it to my sellers is really straightforward. I'll say something to the extent of the first price decrease I'm going to ask you to take on your house is going to be between five and ten thousand dollars. The result of that, or the reason I'm going to ask you to do that, is because it hasn't sold, and it hasn't sold because there's no furniture in it, and people can't visualize themselves in it. So, would you rather spend three thousand dollars up front and get it staged, or would you rather do a five or ten thousand dollar price reduction? And then they pause. Then they pause, and they say, "Okay." let's do the staging because it just makes so much more sense. It's such a small cost and it will really, really help sell the house quicker. So I'm going to stop and get off my soapbox there. Andrea, mm -hmm. thank you for that. I want to move on and talk sure. about the inspections. And you know, when most homes are sold, the buyer will hire an inspector to do inspections. I think that it's really important that you understand how the inspection process works so that you can better anticipate what it is that you're going to experience when somebody gets a contract, puts a contract on your home that you're going to sell. So Bruce, please walk us through a typical home inspection. We're going to get there and we're going to go through the whole house, basement to roof. Uh, we're going to check everything from small maintenance items to major concerns, furnace, water heater, air conditioner, fireplaces, uh, the roof, foundation, a person may have lived in that house for a while and not know that there's a crack. Uh, they haven't ever been up on the roof. They don't know that the shingles are old. Our goal is to make sure that the client going in can know everything about that house that can cause them concern or that they want to get repaired. Yeah, and inspections can make or break the sale of the home. So. Yes. Yeah, so, it, so in, in addition to doing the building inspection that you had just mentioned, roof to basement and everything in between, what other inspections are often done? I think the termite is a big inspection because if you don't know there's termites there, you can end up with a big bill once you're in the house. The other one is the sewer inspection, cameraing the sewer line underneath the house. If it's an older home and it has cast iron or, or clay, there can be roots in it, the clay can be broken. Those are two really big keys that can be an expense to the seller or the buyer. So we're doing termite, we're doing building, you're looking at the roof. I mean, oftentimes when I list a home, I have the roof looked at beforehand. 
uh, so I know what it is that we're going to experience. Maybe we can get a new roof on there at no cost or obligation or minimal cost based on an insurance claim. So there's lots of things that we can do proactively there. Uh, we didn't talk about radon, but their radon is something that's often tested for. And then uh, Correct. Why don't you talk about radon and, 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 a, uh, and a gas inspection as well? Uh, the gas inspection is also a great idea, especially if there's a gas fireplace, uh, checking for gas leaks, uh, the furnace, the stove. Radon also is another inspection that some people are doing. Uh, since radon is a gas that comes up through the ground uh, and the mitigation is relatively inexpensive if there is uh, a radon issue. Right, so hopefully when you bought this house, uh, assuming that it was in recent history, you know, you did a bunch of inspections coming in, you found things that, that, that needed to be taken care of, um, and then you asked the, the seller of the home to take care of it. That's exactly what's going to come back to you, uh, and it often does. So let's just assume then, Bruce, you do the, your inspections, you're spending, what, two hours, maybe more inspecting the house? Two to three hours, and I'll be honest, I don't leave an inspection until the realtor and the client are happy and we've gone through everything. And that means if we go through it a second time, we go through it a second time. We want to make sure everything that we can possibly find in that time frame is found. Right. So in during that inspection process, and then John, maybe you can mention this, um, who typically comes to the inspection? Well, I'll agree. I mean, basically what people don't understand a lot of times is that on inspections, it really depends on what the contract says. It generally, the buyer is allowed to go there and the, the people are going to buy the property as well as the agent. Um, now, in this COVID-19 time period right now, a lot of times no one's going to the inspection except the inspector themselves. And, um, but, you know, I mean, that's typically who is at the inspection. I mean, it's not really an opportunity for somebody to show the property again. <laughs> Right, but how often does it, does it happen that mom and dad come, cousin Bill comes, um, Johnny comes who likes to think he knows what he's talking about in regard to repairs and gets in the ear of the inspector? Is that something that happens? It is something that happens, but you know, Ted, as you know, if you're a strong listing agent, you make sure that the buyer's agent is very aware of what the contract reads and that who should be there. So if that does happen, you know, you have to deal with it. I think I think that brings up a point like you know, as far as from an agent standpoint, an agent who understands con the contract and kind of can guide and kind of keep control of the situation. I know you, that you do that for your sellers too. Is that you make sure that things are, you know, rules are adhered to. It's like that the license, the, the the contract is followed. Um, quite honestly, our contract doesn't say that people are allowed to bring everybody back through there, but people do. But a strong listing agent will make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, and I'm sure there's been situations where um, younger buyers especially might have been talked out of buying a house by a, um, a very overly caring relative who might just, you know, see things and just get scared. So that kind of stuff happens. Well, so. The problem is you have an inspection and like even now, people aren't able to get to the PIP to see something. So they're unable to, um, they may get a report and if the report's not clear, then they may have an issue as far as like, you know, it, it may raise more red flags than it's necessary. So I think, I think that's where you might get people going sideways. Yeah, could very well be. I, mean, I had a situation with COVID-19 going on that uh, the buyers came <laughs> to the house with the family. That it seemed like they, they, they rented a bus and they probably had about 30 people go through the house. It was beyond ridiculous. Oh. But, but that kind of stuff happens. So to get back on point, uh, Bruce, so you generate a, a written report and the inspection docs go to the buyers. The buyers in turn uh, look at that document, they review it with their agent, and they come back with a, a list of items that they're looking to be taken care of by the seller. Is that? That is correct, yes. Also pictures along with it so they see what we are talking about. Uh, along with the written statement with it. Right. So then yeah. on the back end, once you get that report, the report goes to the listing agent, shares it with his sellers, his or her sellers, and then the decisions are made as to what the seller of the home is willing to, to fix, whether they might issue a credit. Uh, we go back and forth. We typically have um, in our contracts up to 10 days that can be modified based upon the terms that are written in the contract. But let's say we have 10 days to go and do our diligence, decide what we're going to fix, what we're not going to fix. 
And I'd say most of the time, you know, we're able to come to terms uh, in regard to what's going to be taken care of or not being taken care of, and everybody walks away happy. There's that old saying about, you know, what's the sign of a successful negotiation is that neither side walks away happy. Uh, so, so sometimes, <laughs> right? So, so sometimes, sometimes that's what it is. But we get it done, and we part as friends, and then, and then that's it. Uh, Bruce, is it just the home buyers that hire you? No, we also do home ins inspections for home sellers, which hopefully will make it easier for the realtors to price the home with the with the sellers because we find things that may need to be taken care of ahead of time the seller the buy, the seller may have been there for 10 15 years doesn't know there's a crack in the foundation doesn't know there's a bad roof doesn't know there's a crack in the fireplace uh these things can save you a lot of headaches ahead of time yeah i'm a strong proponent of it and john i know you are as well take care of as much as you can take yeah. care of up front reduce the number of objections you have on the back end of it disclose what you have to disclose and then uh, everyone's on the same uh, playing field and we all know exactly the condition of the home great so and uh, bruce let, let me ask you one last question roughly what do inspections home inspections cost uh, base for a basic inspection, anywhere from 350 to 400, and then the termite, the sewer, the radon all add up to that. You could be anywhere uh, to 700 to 800 dollars, 900 dollars for all the inspections, depending on the size of the home. Right. So there's some motivation there to, um, I guess, to make sure that this deal works because you're investing that kind of money. Though people will walk away after investing that kind of money. And then there's also probably the desire from many buyers to make sure that they get their dollars worth out of the cost of the inspection, whether it be on repairs or concessions. So there's a little bit of a strategy that's going on there as well, I have to think. But I think bottom line is, is that buyers want to make sure that they're buying a home that's in good shape. And I think sellers realistically want to sell something that's in good shape based mm -hmm. upon what it is um, that they're selling the house for. So I think we're all on the same page wanting to make sure that things are taken care of. And I've had many sellers really, really want to be proactive and really make sure that everything was turned over um, properly to the next owners of this home that they've spent so much time and, uh, and emotion in. So I think what you do is really important and I uh, appreciate you uh, telling us what you did. Bruce. Ted, I, yes. I want to add something that a lot of people watching this may not be aware of, but they may be in a municipality or even an unincorporated area and they're not even aware that they will have new municipal inspections oh. that are required. They might be in a fire district like, you know, like Wild, like Wildwood out there in Chesterfield, like, or they might be in St. Louis Unincorporated County and they actually have a St. Louis County inspection. A lot of people who've been in their houses, because they've only been, these, these have only been happening in the last 10 years or so. Uh -huh. And so people are not aware of that. And so having a pre-home inspection, you can become aware of things that maybe the county inspector is going to see or whatever too. So I think, I think a lot of it is, um, is just understanding. I mean, you can be in a house and not be aware of issues that you have going on, but somebody with a fresh set of eyes comes in and goes, oh, wow, look at that or what's going on. And that's mm -hmm. why the inspector has a fresh set of eyes and actually has a report to back it up. That's why it's important. Yeah, and that's an excellent point. Thanks for bringing that up, John. When these municipal inspections occur, some municipalities will just look at the exterior, and that's almost an ongoing thing. You know, if if I lived in my house and my siding was falling down and my trees were overgrown and my grass was high, my neighbor or a neighbor may decide to call in the municipality and say, hey, this place is really trash. Can you get them to fix it up a little bit, spruce it up? So I think the municipalities are, I don't know that they're proactively looking at these things, but sometimes it comes up and they're taking care of things and, and, and holding you accountable for the exterior of your home. But then there are also municipalities, as John had mentioned, that are gonna come into your home and they're gonna check for safety related items. They're gonna look at plumbing, they're gonna look at electrical outlets, they're gonna look at a variety of different things that you need to be aware of. And again, if we take care of this up front, we'll pass their inspections, which is critical, because if you don't, whoever buys your house can't occupy it. And that creates all sorts of other issues. So as you can tell, this starts to get a little complicated and that's why bringing in a, a, a veteran real estate agent like John, um, and someone who really knows what they're doing, who can save you the pain uh, of what you w might experience if you have somebody uh, who's not experienced selling homes or if you decide to do it yourself. It's not as easy as it looks. There's, 
Ted, real quick too, we also during our consultations, we talk about um, repairing things in your home that need to be fixed. And we always encourage them to go ahead and have a pre-inspection done because we don't, we said at the time the building inspection does occur, we don't want a nightmare, you know, because then the buyers will come in and they're gonna ask for more money and things like that. So we always recommend that too, for people to go ahead and have that done. We think it's such an important key. Sure. Making sure the house is in great condition. Yeah, and I'll add to that, and then we'll 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 move on to one last part of this process. But the downside to to not having the home prepared and having a what I'll call a disastrous inspection is that we might tie up the property, get it under contract. There was a bidding war for it, um, or we finally got a contract on it. We have inspections. The buyer gets scary. They've tied us up for. 10 days, maybe 14 days, decide to bail. And next thing you know, we have to go back on the market where there are fewer buyers uh, and we have to explain why the deal fell through. So it can really, really cost you um, if you don't take care of the things that are really, really, um, that really, really should be taken care of. There's another critical component of the real estate sales process that I wanna make sure that everybody's aware of and that's the role of the title company. Here in the St. Louis marketplace, I assume Missouri in general, we use title companies to handle the closing process. And I'd like Shelly to, to focus on that a little bit. Shelly, in the real estate transaction, what does the title company do? Well, what the title company does, Ted, is we make sure that the seller has absolute right to sell that property, um, that they have full ownership in that property, and there's no liens that can be a problem for that new buyer. Um, and what the title company does is issues a policy to that new buyer um, that's good forever. Um, so that's, that's the last piece, like you were saying to the puzzle, um, from start to finish, is to walk away with that title policy that they, have, they can rest assured that there's not gonna be an issue on that property going forward. Okay, so you issue, issue this title insurance policy just in case uh, something is missed along in the process? Well, no, I mean, partially yes, but here's, here's the situation. It could be a problem from a previous owner um, that nobody knew about. Um, uh, title companies can make a mistake. There could be something that's not recorded that wasn't found of record. Um, but just like homeowner's insurance that you pay every year, you're gonna pay title insurance one time when you buy the property and never again. To, for the biggest, biggest purchase of your entire life. Um, it's a one-time fee, which I think is pretty important. Um, you know, take example, we talked about inspections just a minute ago with Bruce. And if there's inspections and repairs to be done on that property, and let's say a seller um, had the repair work done but didn't pay a contractor, that contractor can put a mechanic lien against that property. Well, you don't want that to be an issue as the buyer buying that property three months after they bought the home, they get a knock at the door that there's money owed for a contractor. Um, but the title company then has to step in. You know, the seller didn't make us aware of that item um, and there wasn't a mechanic lien filed at that time. How would a title company know? Um, so that's why you purchase the title insurance to be protected over those kind of items. Right. So oftentimes when repairs are made, and I have a number of roughly $500 in my head, if a repair is more than $500, I can expect that the title company is going to ask for a paid in full receipt as well as a lien waiver signed by that contractor. Is that a good Absol idea? Absolutely. We definitely want all the paid receipts and lien waivers for $500 and above to make sure that that seller did pay um, for all the repair work. Right. Because and it is risky. Yeah, and sometimes that comes last minute because we're making repairs just before closing and a day or two before closing, we realize that we don't have a lien waiver and then all of a sudden we start to have to jump up and down and try to try to get that to happen. Yeah, and, and Ted, not every lien waiver is an acceptable lien waiver, which a lot of sellers don't, are not aware of that. They just accept what the contractor is giving them. Um, but you know, if you read the lien waiver and there's a third paragraph that says this is lien waivers contingent upon the payment clearing or something else being done, then that's not a true unconditional lien waiver. Um, and every title company wants that because they're providing the insurance to the buyer that there won't be any liens filed. Okay. So oftentimes too, the title company is ordering the survey that the buyer is going to do. So the buyer has a, uh, let me step back. 
So oftentimes we're not using the same title company that the other party is using. So the seller may have their own title company and the buyer may have their own title company, right? Yes, correct. Yes, we do split. We call that split closings here in Missouri. Um, not many other states um, handle closings that way, um, but we do. Got it. So, and, and at closing, the sellers are never getting together and sitting at the same table as the buyers. Correct. So right. I, I know that's a little bit different as well. I know in the state of New York, they're all sitting at the table and they're using attorneys and all that kind of stuff. We don't use attorneys here in the, in the state of Missouri. So, yes. so you order survey. So, or I'm sorry, the buyer's title company will order a survey on the property as well, assuming that a survey is, is ordered by the buyer, correct? Correct, yes. Um, and what, what people don't understand about that either, um, Ted, is surveys are so important to show where the home and improvements are on that property. But there's two types of surveys to be ordered. It's either a surveyor's real property report, which is a cheaper type survey. It doesn't show fencing. But if you uh, purchase as a buyer a boundary survey, that's gonna show every single improvement where it's located on the property and where those fences lie. Um, and for properties that are very old that have fences that have been there for a long time, you as a buyer want to know if those fences were put in the right place. And that's what the boundary survey is gonna show. So that's included in your title insurance policy. Um, yeah. Right. And I've seen surveys where obviously the fence is not where it's supposed to be. The driveway is not where it's supposed to be. A, um, a patio is not where it's supposed to be. A deck's not where it's supposed to be. And then all of a sudden we have to jump through some hoops and get that done. Again, normally we're able to get things done. Sometimes neighbors have to cooperate with one another and sign some documentation allowing certain things. So it can get a little complicated. There's no Absolutely. question about that. Let's talk about earnest money because that's something that's important that we haven't discussed yet, but we write a contract. In order for a contract to be considered a, a binding contract, some money has to be deposited or exchanged yeah. for that to be binding. Talk to us about earnest money and um, everything that goes along with that. Yeah, the earnest money, so the buyer can, it, it can be acceptable in different um, ways. It can be a check from the buyer for the earnest money deposit. Um, and which is the good faith deposit that you just talked about. Um, so it gives the seller assurance that that buyer really wants to buy that property and is going to do everything to follow through with, with doing that because they're tying up the property for however many months um, for that buyer. Um, either a selling broker can, be, can hold that earnest money or a title company. It has to be listed in the contract. Um, but if the title company is holding it, they can accept a check. Um, it can be sent by wire transfer or a company called trust funds. Um, and they hold that into their escrow account until the deal closes. Um, once the deal closes, that money will be um, credited to them towards the purchase price. Um, and yeah, unless the deal falls through, unfortunately, then the money would, uh, stays with the escrow holder until we receive a mutual release, which is signed by all parties, um, that says who were to release the earnest money to. All parties have to agree to that. Got it. All right. So you're holding it. I'm not holding it. John's not holding it. But it's either going to the brokerage, which I find to be rare, though some do, but oftentimes it's going to the title company to hold on to. And then... Um, dispersing it as to whether it's to, however it's supposed to be dispersed per the contract or through the mutual release. So I think that 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 touches on earnest money. Uh, now we're recording this during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, but in general, how does the closing process work? So we have comfortable feeling about how the, you know, what we can expect in regard to how we need to close once that closing date arrives. Yeah, so what happens with, you know, once the contract signed, just briefly, your, the real estate agent gives us a copy of the sales contract and we place the order for the title insurance commitment to be done and provide that to your agent when it is completed to show what liens are against the property, if any, that have to be satisfied prior to closing. Um, whether it be it's a sewer lien, um, a trustee lien, the seller's mortgage payoff, everything that has to be paid off so the buyer is purchasing free and clear title. Um, once that's done, we uh, process the file, we prepare the documents, and then the buyer closes at their closing time with the title company, and the seller closes their title company um, at their closing time, which we talked about separately, not together. Um, typically, the buyer signs first in the morning, 
Um, so all their documents will be signed, they bring their funds. Um, but during the pandemic that we just talked about, we have an interesting way to close. We're doing drive up closings um, for the safety of the customers and the employees. All title companies are doing that. Um, so they're signing in their car, but going forward, hopefully when um, this is over, we'll be back to do closing in the office um, with the agent and the lender and the buyer um, and your escrow officer um, who explains all the documents. Um, so you thoroughly understand what you're signing. Um, and then you turn over your cashier's check for the per for what you owe at closing. Um, then the seller has to close um, and sign the deed that transfers the property to the new buyer for the purchase price. Um, and then once everybody's signed, we're funded, we disperse the file, we send it to recording and we're done. Great, and the funds, uh, assuming you know, I sell my house and things close, I get my check or the wire, the funds can be wired directly into a, into a, a checking account? Absolutely, absolutely. Now these days, back 20 years ago when I closed full time, we used to be able to, you know, the buyer would close, we'd have checks cut ready for the seller to come in and hand over the seller their check. It doesn't happen that way um, any longer. So typically the sellers are receiving wire, a wire transfer for their proceeds. Right, and it takes a couple of hours, typically I've found, for the funds to make it from the buyer's title company to your title company and then get everything processed and the check be ready to be picked up. We're not walking out with, with a check most of the time. Correct, yeah, not any longer. Got it. All right, well that really sums things up. Before we say goodbye, does anybody have anything to add? Well, I want to add something for the title because something I love about investors is that I run sell reports before I list a property so that if there's a title issue that comes up, I'm aware of it before we go on the contract. And the other thing yeah, is- Thank you, John, for saying that. Yes, per mm -hmm. that's perfect. Because I, I mean, and, and another thing is too, a lot of times when you're, as an agent, you list, you meet these people, you meet somebody, I just had this happen, and they didn't tell me their property was in a trust. They were right. just my friends. And so they since they bought the property, they've moved their property into a trust. And so having a seller's title or a seller's report done before is critical in my opinion. And then another thing is too, is that nobody can ever find their subdivision bylaws and indentures. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. you get it. another important thing too. So that's just my yes. props for an investor's title. Right. Oh, and, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And having that informational report beforehand is, is, is key. Oftentimes, as John had mentioned, I'll do it before I even take the listing. So I know that the listing documents are signed correctly. And then for yeah. sure, you want to have it in place to make sure that the contract documents are signed directly. Uh, you can ultimately go back and, and do amendments and things along those lines, but it's much cleaner when you have it done the right way up front. So that's just uh, John showing his experience again. And yes, investors does a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I just want to say one thing too is that we worked several times with Ted and John and attention to detail, which makes it work. And they know how to hire the best people to come in. So you know, if you're thinking about doing it on your own, you've got two people here that um, are experts. They've been in the in the profession for a long time and they know what they're doing. So like I said, attention to detail is the key. Um, and those two gentlemen, they, they take care of that. They take well, care of their clients extremely well. Andrea, I agree 100%. Thank you. So yeah. John and I, we're not just another pretty face, huh, John? Yeah. You're just not another pretty hey, face. Hey, no. Ted? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I wanted to say, I know for some buyers, inspections seem like a lot of money. But as you well know, it's better to have that cost before you find out that you have a ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 repair. Yeah later on down the line. So, I, and I know that's tough for people that think they're putting out a lot of money for an inspection, but in the long run, it can save you from buying something that you may not want to get into, or at least for the seller too. They may find out they have to repair something that sure. they didn't know about. Yeah, and I agree. And John and I, I'm sure we walk up to a house, we look at the roof, we look at the sidewalks, we look at things, we mm -hmm. smell things, we know things, we know where the problems are. When we first walk into that house, we highly encourage that you take care of those things up front. It's just so critical to be successful on the back end. Some folks have an appetite to cure it. Other folks do not. So we work around that. But that's just, it's part of the added value that an experienced real estate agent is going to bring uh, to the table. Don't do it alone. Absolutely. It'll end up costing you on the, on the back end. 
yeah, and getting a seller, getting a seller's inspection, you know, Ted, you and I, we can say, yeah, that roof is good. But having a third party who's already been paid, who doesn't care, that doesn't have a dog in the fight, you know what I'm saying? Oh, because that roof is good. It's much. That's why inspections are important. It's a third yeah, it party. It really is. Approach. Oh, it's it, it's certainly critical. All right. Well, everybody, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to share with us. I'm sure the audience appreciates appreciates it as well. Our next seminar online is going to be on staying well. Uh, our panelists will include a nutritionist, a physical therapist, a doctor of pharmacy, and a registered nurse who focuses on foot care. So we're going from, from selling the home to, to <laughs> keeping you in there and keeping you healthy. So boy, we're all over the place. Uh, so please check us out when you have time. I'd like to thank the following sponsors for supporting the 2020 seminar series. They are Friendship Village, Sunset Hills, and Chesterfield, 101 Mobility of St. Louis, the East Step Law Firm, Drew Ishmael at Edward Jones, Right at Home St. Louis, Assistance Home Care, Oasis Senior Advisors of Chesterfield, Lasting Impressions, Home Remodeling, Shrupp Senior Services, who focuses on Medicare, Quest Care Care Management, 360 Caliber Quality Care and Transport Services, the Mr. Dennis Cooper at the Federal Savings Bank and Eureka Contracting and Roofing, and of course, Team Ted Real Estate. Thank you all again for listening to this Senior Learning Institute educational moment. At the Institute, we strive to provide the straightforward and unbiased information you need to make smart decisions the first time. We connect older adults and their advocates to the resources they need to make informed decisions from aging in place to selling the home in any condition estate and financial planning, in-home care, estate sales, clean-out services, you name it, anywhere in the U.S. To learn more, please visit us at the SeniorLearningInstitute.com. Until next time, I'm Ted Gottlieb, Certified Senior Advisor, Seniors Real Estate Specialist, and founder of the Senior Learning Institute.